If it's Monday, renewed questions and outrage about policing in America after the fatal beating of Tyree Nichols as a sixth Memphis police officer is taken off the streets for his role in the brutal incident. Plus, deeply pessimistic and deeply divided, what our first NBC News poll since the midterms reveals about voters' outlook on the future as de Democrats and Republicans set their sights on 2024. And a new push to send U.S. fighter jets to Ukraine as President Zelensky urges the West to send more weapons now, days after the U.S. and Germany agreed to send tanks to the region. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker in Washington, where the issue of policing in this country is once again center stage, following demonstrations over the weekend over the fatal beating of Tyree Nichols by Memphis police officers. Today, police confirmed that a sixth officer has been relieved of duty for his involvement in the incident. So far, that officer, Preston Hemphill, has not been fired or charged with a crime. That comes after hundreds of protesters gathered in Memphis this weekend to peacefully voice their anger and grief over the death of Tyree Nichols, the 29-year-old man who was horrifically beaten by five now former police officers at a traffic stop earlier this month. The video released on Friday night showed how officers stopped Nichols, tased and pepper sprayed him, then hit, punched, kick, and struck him with their batons. Officers beat Nichols long after the video appears to show him incapacitated, and there was an excruciatingly long delay before first aid was provided. On Saturday, protesters continued to call for accountability, justice, and reform. To hear a young man call for his mom, I have a son, I have a black son, and to hear this man call for his mom, that turns a mother upside down to hear that. And those are words I never want to hear or see my son or even look at it on TV. That's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. And they need to be held accountable. Everybody needs to be held accountable. The five officers were fired and all of them were charged with second degree murder and other charges before the release of the video. There were also protests in New York, Los Angeles, Oakland, and Louisville this weekend, all places where incidents of police violence have made national headlines in recent years. Now, despite the outcry across the country, Congress remains stalled on bills proposed in response to George Floyd's death in 2020. And Republicans in control of the House have shown little interest in legislating around the issue. Ohio Republican Jim Jordan told Chuck on Meet the Press yesterday he does not see a federal legislative solution to police brutality. Take a listen. But I don't know if there's anything you can do to stop the kind of evil we saw in that video. So uh, it sounds like you are not for any new federal regulation. Well, there's, there's things we can do. I think there's all kinds of grant dollars that go out. There's reform that can happen there. We, we offered amendments to a bill. Uh, Tim Scott had legislation. That wasn't what the Democrats brought forward mm -hmm. a few years ago. Um, so I think there's some things we can, we can, we can look at, but it's just a difference in, in, I think, a philosophy. The Democrats always think that it's, it's a new law that's going to fix something yeah. that terrible. Look, most people don't want to commit murder, but we have a federal standard uh, when yeah. it comes to murder. Um, the, if we can incentivize certain things, I still think you want to keep this at the state and local level. This is a law enforcement issue. You start getting the federal government involved in databases and federalizing yeah. things, that gets, because the federal government screws it up so many times. Well, members of the Congressional Black Caucus turned to the White House yesterday asking President Biden to push for negotiations on police reform and requesting a formal meeting on the issue. Joining me now is Ellison Barber in Memphis, Tennessee, and Ali Vitale is on Capitol Hill tracking all of the developments there. Ellison, I want to start with you. What are you seeing? What are you hearing on the ground in Memphis today? We saw these peaceful protests over the weekend, but clearly, clearly there is still a lot of hurt and pain in that community. Yeah, I mean, kind of the general reaction from everyone when they saw that video Friday was disgust. But what protesters, what community activists here, what the family of Tyree Nichols wants is for people to not just feel disgusted, but for something to actually change. And we have heard community activists throughout the weekend take to the streets, hold candlelight vigils to demand exactly that. There will be another candlelight vigil uh, in a couple of hours at the park that Tyree Nichols spent a lot of of his time, where he liked to go skateboarding, where he liked to take photos of the sunset. What his family is asking for, though, is for this 
moment for his death to lead to something bigger. They don't want to see criminal justice or police reform only in Memphis. They want to see this happen nationwide. You know, that police unit in particular that these officers were involved with, the Scorpion unit, it has been disbanded here, but there are a lot of units in other police departments uh, that are very similar to this type of unit. And so what we're hearing people talk about right now is wanting to see bigger change, deeper reform, but also a lack of confidence that that can happen. I was talking to someone uh, on this sidewalk earlier this afternoon, and I asked him how long he felt like he'd been waiting to see some sort of reform as it relates to policing. He said throughout his life as a child, he'd been harassed, pulled over by police officers because he is a black man and he has lived in communities uh, where there's high crime. He said that he waited his entire life to see some sort of reform when I asked when do you think that could happen he said he doesn't really think it can happen anytime soon but he hopes that it will he was I asked him specifically about disbanding that scorpion unit and he said it's a mentality issue that you can get rid of one unit but that's just a unit that's just the name and more has to be done so there's a real reckoning a real discussion of what should happen to actually cause systemic change and whether or not there's actually the will or the desire in this country to do it. Yeah, you raise such an important and really the crux of this issue. And, and Ali, with that, let me go to you, because as I just laid out, the George Floyd policing bill had some momentum in the wake of George Floyd's horrific yeah. killing, and yet it was not passed. There were a number of sticking points, of course, one of them being qualified immunity, which essentially shields officers in many cases um, from any civil liability. What are you hearing about any renewed effort to get legislation passed? And what are the are those still the remaining sticking points? Yes, those are still the sticking points. And in fact, if we look back at the way these negotiations fell apart, there was still that griping behind the scenes at the time about who was to blame for the negotiations breaking down on the Senate side. That blame game is actually still going on. If you look at the fact that Senator Cory Booker was leading on the Democratic side on this, he put out a statement in the aftermath of this latest act of violence saying that he would not give up on police reform. But then we also heard from an aide close to Senator Tim Scott, who was the leading Republican on those negotiations, making clear that he's not the one who walked away from the table, effectively saying that it wasn't his fault that the negotiations negotiations broke down. So there might still be some argument over process, not even over the policy piece of this, that could stand in the way of restarting these negotiations. Nevertheless, the other big thing that's changed between the end of 2021 when those negotiations broke down and now is the fact that Democrats still control the Senate, but they do not control mm -hmm. the House anymore. And the numbers here right now, even with one Republican lawmaker from New York saying that something needs to be done here, they lack the numbers. And you listen to Jim Jordan over the weekend, head of the Judiciary Committee, where these reforms would probably be centered, what committee they would stem from. You hear him saying there's no federal solution to be had here. It's hard to feel optimistic about this from a congressional standpoint. Yeah, I, th I think that that is the, the hard reality of this divided government, Ali, that, that we are all now covering. Ellison, let me go back to you because Jim Jordan said over the weekend to Chuck, effectively, he thinks if there's going to be any change, it has to happen at the state or local level. What are you hearing inside the state there about any potential reforms that may be being proposed? I mean, look, there's already efforts underway within the police department here, right? The big step that took place this weekend was the announcement that the so-called Scorpion unit, a uh, unit that was formed less than two years ago that specifically was intended to focus on combating car thefts and gang violence, but going into areas that are designated hotspot communities. It is a controversial style of policing, something that we have seen used uh, in a lot of different police departments in the United States from the anti-crime units in New York uh, within the NYPD that were perhaps most famously, if you will, associated with stop and frisk policies, Red Dogs in Atlanta, other similar units in Chicago, Detroit, all of them controversial, a lot of them already disbanded. So there was a step here to get rid of this type of policing that critics say uh, puts police officers into oftentimes black and brown communities and 
essentially gives them a longer leash permission to stop people for small things uh, in order to try and find something bigger. Critics would say it is entrapment. We're seeing some of those changes mm -hmm. taking place here. But again, people here say they feel like it's not enough. What we have heard from the attorneys representing Tyree Nichols' families, what we have heard from his parents is that they want to see something at the federal level. And they have specifically mentioned that legislation, the George Floyd Policing Act, which uh, doesn't seem like there's going to be a lot of movement there. Yeah. And, and Ali, to that point, we did hear President Biden saying this weekend that he wants to revive the George Floyd um, policing bill. And we know that Tyree Nichols' parents have now been invited to the State of the Union address. What does that tell you, at least about the push that we might see from the White House? Well, look, we know that the White House is going to have to push on this issue. They had pushed for the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act uh, in 2021 before those negotiations fell apart. Clearly, they'll continue pushing for it now. Then Senator Kamala Harris was a leader in trying to put that together. And I'm sure we'll continue if these conversations end up with any kind of momentum behind them. We've also seen, though, the Congressional Black Caucus trying to huddle with the White House, asking for a meeting, trying to find some kind of path forward on this. Part of putting the pressure on will be having Tyree Nichols' parents at the State of the Union, allowing for that moment that you have to imagine is going to be just so deeply sorrowful and solemn just a few feet away from me in the House chamber yeah. on February 7th. But look, I mean, it doesn't change the numerical realities of this building, which is partly why advocates and Democrats who want to see this kind of action feel so frustrated right now. All right. Great reporting by both of you, Ellison Barber, Ali Vitale, thank you both. I now want to bring in Van Turner, president of the NAACP Memphis branch and civil rights attorney David Henderson. Van, I want to start with you and just say that, that our thoughts are with your community um, as you continue to mourn and start the process of, of trying to hold each other up in this incredibly painful moment. How is the community holding up? What is the mood there, particularly in the wake of this weekend's peaceful protest, but now that the video is really starting to sink in? I mean, the mood is still one of uh, disgust, anger, disappointment. Uh, the fact that these were African-American officers and Tyree Nichols was African-American, it begs the question, how could they do this to another uh, black man. And so these are the questions that are being asked. This is the turmoil that we're all going through. We're yet again on the national spotlight. Nationwide protests are breaking out. And the last time that we saw this was 55 years ago when mm -hmm. Dr. King was assassinated here at the Lorraine Motel. Mm -hmm. So it's been tough. Um, and we are hopefully using this as a call to action to move the agenda forward. I think that we need the federal legislation. I know that some may think that it's not a possibility, but that doesn't mean we don't try. We need to also uh, seek legislation here in our state general assembly. So we're going to work towards that end on behalf of the NACP. David, on that point of action that you would like to see taken, I was obviously just speaking with our reporter Ali Vitale about the George Floyd policing bill, and it included a number of proposals from qualified immunity to banning chokeholds and most no-knock warrants. Are those the types of reforms that you want to see? What do you think needs to happen to prevent another Tyree Nichols from losing his life like this? 100%. Those are the types of reforms that I want to see. Those are the types of reforms that we need to have to prevent this from happening again. And it's worth noting that we've had many conversations in recent years about similar incidents like this. Nothing has happened to prevent them. So it's really hard to listen to Representative Jordan, as we heard in the opening segment, say that it should be left at the local level when it has been left at the local level and people are still being wrongfully killed by the police, even in instances like this where they're being murdered by the police. We are talking about Dr. Dr. King, just a moment ago, I worked with one of the last living links to Dr. King, and part of our moral responsibility as civil rights lawyers is to maintain hope. That's really difficult when we start to talk about police reform because the simple truth is there's not much room for negotiation here. You have to eliminate qualified immunity if you want to see a change. You have to limit chokeholds, but more importantly, you have to limit a tool that police officers use that they refer to as pain compliance, which is essentially state-sanctioned torture. Something that you refer to as pain compliance should per se be unconstitutional, but it is not. 
Well, and we're both talking about changes at the federal level. The one change we have seen uh, at the local level is that the police department in Memphis has disbanded the Scorpion Union. Now, we know that these are units all across the country. And one of the concerns is that you have some veteran officers who are aging out. They're bringing in new people, concerns that they're not getting the training that they need. David, does disbanding the Scorpion unit go far enough? What more needs to happen? No, disbanding the unit does not go far enough. And here's the problem that I have with celebrating that too much. They created the unit. They recruited the officers who became part of the unit. They supervised or failed to supervise the unit, and they sent them out on the street with an admission to be aggressive on crime whenever they believed they encountered it. So they are cleaning up a mess that they created. And here's the problem. All the officers in that unit who received the training that led to them being in the Scorpion unit in the first place are now going to be dispersed throughout the police department. Mm -hmm. So if you don't do anything to change the culture of what led them to be part of that unit in the first place, what good does simply disbanding the unit do if there's going to be no level of accountability when they behave the same way, just another context within the same police department? Van, can you weigh in on that point? What was your reaction to hearing that the Scorpion unit had been disbanded and, and what do you want to see happen, not just at the local level, but in police departments all across the country? Well, uh, as was stated, the, the, the disbanding of the Scorpion unit was important, but the culture is still there. So there has to be a disruption, uh, a, dis, uh, a disbanding of this culture uh, in law enforcement, which allows these law enforcement agents to go into black and brown communities and think that uh, good policing is pulling folks out of their cars uh, without uh, the probable cause and, and, and using uh, tactics that should not be used uh, in order to uh, force some type of compliance. And as we see here, Tyree Nichols had done uh, nothing wrong. And he asked, what have I done? And, and so I think we have to change the culture. We have to double down on the training. We have to eliminate all of these specialty units with the tactical gear and the philosophy that, that they are going to war uh, on our communities. They're there to serve and protect, not to make war on the community. Van, we, like all communities, want crime addressed, but we don't want innocent people killed. Van, I want to follow up on something that you started to talk about, which is that all five of the officers who've now been charged are African-American. They were charged before the video was put out. Ben Crump, who is the attorney for the family, spoke about this. He said, OK, fine, but now this needs to be the blueprint. I want to play for you what he had to say and get both of your reaction on the other side. When we look at how these five black officers who were caught on camera committing a crime, and when we look at how fast the police chief and the police department terminated them. And we look at how swiftly the district attorney brought charges against them in less than 20 days. Mama. Then we want to proclaim that this is the blueprint going forward reaction is it realistic and part of what he is essentially saying is whether the officers are white brown whatever race wherever their background is they should be held to this standard is that realistic david no not across the board in terms of what we expect to see in other cities and let me say this very clearly i agree with what attorney crump said I agree this should be the blueprint. What I have to be honest with myself in assessing is you've got a blueprint, but no funding or direct plans to actually build the house. And you also have to keep in mind, if we want to have change, we want to be positive and hopeful. We also have to be realistic in terms of what is happening. Memphis is trying to protect itself. We saw the same thing in the trial of the murder of George Floyd. The police department appeared to be more transparent. It's actually trying to protect itself. Memphis knows the only real form of police reform we have right now is the current Justice Department. The Justice Department will come and start investigating what's going on in Memphis and eventually create a consent decree if Memphis doesn't take some steps to get out in front of it. And so that is what they are trying to do right here. Something that is worth noting that goes along with what he said, though. Not only did they take swift, swift action to indict these officers, but it is ironic that these officers, if they're convicted of the crimes that they are charged with, will face a higher level of punishment for their crimes than we have seen any police officers face in the modern 
modern era and possibly in history. I'm not aware of an example mm -hmm. of an officer being convicted and potentially serving 60 years. That's almost three times what Derek Chauvin served for murdering George Floyd. Van, final thought to you. We only have a few seconds left. And, and what you want to see from the president and the White House from this? Well, we want to see what he said he's going to do. We want to see a big push towards passing the George Floyd uh, Reform Act. I know that he's invited the family to the State of the Union. Hopefully, this will be a call to action from the president to make the type of change, the lasting change that we need here in this country. We want it. Uh, we need it. And I believe the country needs it and wants it as well. Thank you for this critical conversation, Van Turner and David Henderson. We really appreciate your joining us. Thank you. Coming up, I will talk to the member of Congress who represents the Memphis area on how he thinks the death of Tyree Nichols should change policing in Tennessee and in America. That's next. Plus, new NBC News polling finds soaring levels of voter pessimism and polarization, what it means, and reaction from voters in two of the most important battlegrounds on the map. That's next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Our first NBC News poll of the new year paints a picture of a deeply pessimistic country with an overall outlook that is historically bleak. Our new poll shows 71 percent believe we're on the wrong track as a nation, with only 23 percent saying we're headed in the right direction. Now, this is the longest sustained period of a wrong track number this high in the history of our poll. It's been this high for nearly two and a half years now. When we ask them to describe where America is headed in the next year, more than two thirds of Americans use negative words and phrases among Republicans. Downhill, wrong track and disaster were the top picks. And even among Democrats, whose top descriptor was hopeful, many used words like uncertain, concerned, and again downhill. And despite legislative wins and better than expected midterms, President Biden's job approval sits at 45 percent, which is essentially unchanged from November. Taking the temperature of voters on the ground for us are NBC's Shaq Brewster in Manchester, New Hampshire, and Dasha Burns is in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania. Thanks to both of you for being here. And Shaq, I want to start with you. The new NBC News poll shows most of the country is just not optimistic about the direction we're headed in. Does yeah. that match what you're hearing from voters there on the ground? What are people telling you? Oh, without a doubt. That was mirrored by the conversations that I've been having here in Manchester, New Hampshire. These are important voters, important primary voters, and also important general election voters. And many of them telling me that they're not hopeful about the dysfunction that they're seeing in Washington, D.C., and the gridlock that we've been seeing. Two numbers that pulled that uh, spoke to me uh, directly, if we pull them out, 45 percent of Americans say that they expect President Biden to be too inflexible in his dealings with Congress, while 54 percent of Americans, of voters, say that they expect the Republican Congress to be too inflexible when dealing with President Biden. The concern there is that we have many issues that this Congress and that this president will face over the next year, the next two years, there's a lot of concern that none of their priorities will be addressed, Kristen. Is there any optimism whatsoever that you are hearing from voters that something will get done in this divided government, or are they just throwing up their hands and saying that they have no <laughs> expectation for any progress on anything? It's really a lot of throwing up the hands and saying, I have no expectations. Some people also just checking out of the process. I'll tell you, when I talk to people about 2024 and that election, I mean, the, the idea of New Hampshire being a top primary state, that's in some question right now uh, with the Democratic Party, at least. And many voters saying, look, I'm not even checked into that right now. I'm taking a bit of a, brick, a, a, bit of a break away from that at this point. Some rolling their eyes and making weird faces when I'm asking who they're thinking about uh, for that presidential ballot. But I think a lot of this goes to that uh, pessimism that you see in the poll that's really being reflected all throughout the voters minds very quickly Shaq before I let you go former President Trump was campaigning in New Hampshire over the weekend and the state's Republican governor didn't seem that yeah. impressed what are you hearing from voters <laughs> though yeah, he, uh, he said it was unimpressed and he expected the pre former president to come with more fire. I'll tell you, from some voters that I talked to, there was one Republican voter who said, uh, if Trump doesn't run, then I would support DeSantis. I had to remind him that Trump is the only candidate that has announced that he's running. And he said, oh, OK, yeah, I'm staying with Trump then. He's my guy. I like where the country was uh, during Trump's presidency. So that gives you a sense of two things. One, voters are really trying to check out. But two, 
uh, well, it remains to be seen whether or not other potential candidates could pluck away real significant support from the former president. All right. Great analysis as always. Shaq, appreciate it. Dasha, let me turn to you. You are in a red county in a state that basically went blue in 2022. Talk to me about what voters there on the ground are saying to you. And again, does it match this pessimism that we're seeing in our poll? Yeah, Kristen, well, as Jack said, people might be rolling their eyes when you start talking about 2024, but you know campaign season is around the corner when you find me sitting in a diner in Luzerne County, which, as you mentioned, is red now, but it was a Democratic stronghold up until 2016. And I want you to hear from a woman named Kristen that we talked to, because this kind of really encapsulates what even Republican voters here are thinking. Take a listen. Do you feel optimistic or do you feel like it's possible for the two parties to work together? Um, it's a possibility, but whether they do or not is the question. You know, there's always like, they could work together, but I mean, I, I don't feel optimistic about that, no. Now, when I say even Republican voters, I mean that Republicans here, while they might be frustrated with the Biden administration, a lot of folks that I've talked to really do want to see the GOP-controlled House work together with the administration, with a Democrat-controlled Senate, because they are just frustrated by the stalemate that they have seen for years now. And here in Luzerne County, look, this is not a high-income county. There are a lot of middle-class Americans here, a lot of folks living paycheck to paycheck. So when they see rising inflation... Um, uh, when they see the high interest rates, when they see the gas prices go up, they really, really feel it here day to day. And they really want to see that addressed by both Democrats and Republicans. One interesting thing, though, while the folks I'm talking to, especially those that voted for Donald Trump twice, do miss the Trump era days. They feel like they were doing better at that time. But when I ask them whether they want to see Trump back in office, they hesitate. And the reasons why were really fascinating to me, Kristen. One, one, there's the age factor, which we hear about Biden as well. But two, while these voters think that Trump was a great president, they feel like he has too much baggage at this point, meaning there's just too much controversy swirling around him. Even though they don't think he did anything wrong, they'd rather someone new come in that doesn't have uh, all of that, uh, that, that backdrop, Kristen. Fascinating conversations as we inch closer to 2024. Dasha Burns, thank you so much. And Shaq Brewster beforehand. Up next, my one-on-one -on -one interview with Tennessee Congressman Steve Cohen, whose district includes Memphis, on his push for police reform. You're watching Meet the Press now. Yes, it is time for Congress to act. That is why I spoke to the Nichols family uh, yesterday. I made sure that they knew that we are standing with them on this important matter. Obviously, we send our condolences for the loss of their son, Tyree, but we are going to take action. Welcome back. That was Congressional Black Caucus Chairman Stephen Horsford pledging congressional action after the killing of Tyree Nichols in Memphis. But as we've noted, any major reform bill on policing is going to face long odds in this bitterly divided Congress. Joining me now is Tennessee Democratic Congressman Steve Cohen. He represents Memphis in Congress and is a member of the House Judiciary Committee. Congressman, thank you so much for joining me. And, and again, our thoughts are with your community. Thank you. I want to start by asking about how the folks in Memphis are doing. What have things been like? What are people saying to you since the video has been released? Has it started to sink in for people? Well, I think the video is obviously a, a, a traumatizing to see human beings or to, to, to descend to the level of, of, a, of a criminal gang, uh, mafioso type style behavior that you normally would see in a movie and uh, assaulted and, and killed Tyree Nichols, who's a Nichols who had not done anything apparently. And if he had done anything, he wasn't worthy of anything except uh, apprehension. Uh, it, was a, it was just disgusting to see human beings in that level. But there was no uh, rioting, there was no property damage, there was no personal injuries afterwards. Um, uh, Mrs. Um, 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 Ray, Ray Vaughn, uh, made a good point to asking the public to remain calm as i have done as others have done and the public stayed calm and peaceful and the demonstrations were, were to be expected but they were not uh, anyway riots and and that was that was important and good so i think the people of memphis are just kind of 
digesting what they've seen about their police department. I think they feel that the uh, sheriff uh, was good to uh, taking those two officers or how many were at the scene, put them on looking into their conduct, but that the police chief did right by firing them and the police chief has, was right to ask for calm and she's her, 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 I think, has been she's been seen as a positive force. And, yeah. of course, Attorney General Mulroy and U.S. Attorney Ritz have done good jobs, too. Congressman, but the city, yeah. the city did right. Congressman, and you bring up Tyree Nichols' mom and her powerful plea for peaceful protests. Have you had a chance to speak with her to Mr. Nichols' family? No, I haven't. And I will see her at the funeral. I'm going to go to the funeral Wednesday in Memphis. Uh, I, I tried to call her today. Uh, I don't know if I've got that right number or not, to be honest. I didn't really want to bother them. Mm. But um, they, they've got enough on their hands right now. Well, let's, been... yeah. let's talk about what you would like to see come from this. We've been talking throughout the show about the fact that the George Floyd policing bill has been stalled and that there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of hope that it will be revived in earnest. Do you have any expectation that there can be compromise around these sticking points? What we have talked about, qualified immunity, no knock warrants, banning chokeholds. Well, on, on the, 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 the pop up meet the, meet the press yesterday with uh, Chuck, uh, Jim Jordan made it clear he wanted to do nothing. And he said it was totally a state and local issue. And he didn't think he could stop this behavior with laws. So how do you so, compromise with him? How do you, how do you get something done with someone who sees this as a state and local issue? Almost impossible. You know, we passed it last time with all Democratic votes. We had a majority, and then it died in, in the in the Senate where they tried to get a compromise together, and they couldn't come up with a compromise. Uh, Cory Booker and Tim Scott worked on it, but now the House is predominantly Republican, and I, don't, I think you'll get all the Democratic votes again but you'll come four or five, six votes short. And I don't know if there are four or five or six Republicans that would deviate from the caucus. We could always try a, 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 a method that exists to, to get a bill brought to the floor, uh, extra ordinary means, uh, and, and we could try that, but I don't know if the Republicans would join with us or not. Congressman, you know, we notably in the wake of the Uvalde horrific school shooting, we did see a gun safety reform bill get passed. A and it was a lot smaller than Democrats would have liked to have seen, and I probably included more than a number of Republicans would have liked to see. Do you think that type of legislation is possible, a scaled back version of the George Floyd policing bill? Well, I guess it's possible. To be honest with you, I thought that was even, even greater than scaled back. I thought it was maybe gun reform extremely light it didn't do any of the things we wanted to see in terms of uh, um, automated weapons, uh, magazines uh, that were of a certain size, uh, got bump stocks we didn't deal with because we thought the courts would deal with it. The courts ruled that the, it was not legal to, that the President Trump had done to regulate bump stocks. What we got was a lot of little things about school security and uh, uh, some, some checks on some 21-year-old, 18-year-olds that want to buy guns, some background checks on them. That's important, but that's not the, the big issue is everybody. Mm -hmm. And so what we got was good politics. It was what you can get up here, but it's not enough to make a difference. Let me ask you about Wednesday and shift gears here a little bit. As you know, Speaker McCarthy is going to be meeting with President Biden at issue. The debt ceiling, we are facing the moment at which the Treasury Secretary has said that uh, the U.S. economy will be facing a disaster and going over the cliff. The president has said he's not going to negotiate on this issue. And yet, Speaker McCarthy and Republicans say they want to see spending cuts. Do you expect the president to come off of his stance that he's not going to negotiate? And should he? Well, the president has always been a negotiator and a person that worked for compromise, so maybe he will. But on the other hand, he knows that the 14th Amendment says that the full faith and credit of the Constitution shall not uh, be uh, uh, sacrificed. Do you think the president should negotiate in this moment, Congressman? Uh, no, I don't think so. And, I, and I, there's no need to. We, we have a 14th Amendment that says we've got to keep the full faith and credit of the, of the country and pay our debts. And we should not have to negotiate on paying our why, debts. Why not take on the nation's spending challenges now, as Republicans are arguing? 
I don't know if there are the nation's public challenge, challenge, spending challenges. Most of what they're talking about is cutting Social Security, Medicare, and, and Medicaid. That's people's savings that they, they, they put into the Social Security system. Uh, there's a, certainly a better way to do that, and that's to raise the cap on the level at which you pay into Social Security. That would give enough money to take care of Social Security. Medicaid and Medicare are people's health care, and we shouldn't take health care away from people. We should give more health care. And, and most of the spending that we have in our federal government is defense, and they won't touch defense at all. There's areas where defense should be cut back, but they're not going to touch that. So I don't, I don't see there's any hope on, on these things. And, you know, when you see the, the disparity in wealth and what a, uh, uh, these Bezos and, 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 and Musk and all these people, what they make, and the average person who's looking to try to get a minimum wage of $15, passed and they can't get it because the McDonald's or whoever won't, won't uh, then they can unbelievable corporate profits. We're not going to see that. Right. There's not enough money to help people right now. We need to help people who are in poverty. We need to help people take care of their children, give them an education, have a place to live, place of shelter. We don't have that yet. So we shouldn't cut back on the budget. We should find a place to tax the wealthy, tax the billionaires, and raise the limits on what we take for Social Security, and we can have a healthy economy. All right, Congressman Steve Cohen, thank you so much for joining me on what I know is still a very painful time for you and your community. We really appreciate yes. it. And as we just said, President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy are set to meet face to face with the battle brewing over the debt ceiling. The panel is next to delve into this. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy get set to meet for the first time in this new session of Congress at the White House. Just moments ago, President Biden said his message to Speaker McCarthy was, quote, show me your budget and I'll show you mine. Setting the stage there, joining me now on set is Leanne Caldwell, Washington Post live anchor and co-author of the Washington Post Daily 202 newsletter. Juanita Tolliver, Democratic strategist and an NBC News political analyst. And Stephen Hayes, editor and CEO of The Dispatch and also an NBC News political analyst. Thanks to all of you for being here on a very busy Monday. Leanne, let me just start with you and that message that President Biden has for Speaker <laughs> McCarthy setting the stakes for this meeting on Wednesday. What do you make of it and what do you expect to come out of this meeting? Well, well, President Biden is actually on message with what Democrats have been saying for the past week or so, which is, yes, tell me, Leader McCarthy, what is going to be cut? What is on the table? Democrats think that this is very good politically for them because presenting a number of spending cuts is not necessarily good politics. Um, but then there's the actual practical question, too. Republicans are not on the same page on what they want to cut. And it is going to be very difficult for McCarthy to find 218 votes on any sort of spending cuts because the party doesn't agree on what to cut and by how much. It's a really good point. And yet, Juanita, uh, Republicans are saying we're not backing off of right. this. We are demanding spending cuts. Do you think that President Biden can continue to say he's not going to negotiate. You just heard Congressman Steve Cohen say, well, he is a negotiator. He is someone who actually likes to negotiate. Right. So we'll have to see what happens here. He likes to make deals, but not on this, not after 2011. That trauma, that experience, he knows he wants no part of again. To remind and, people what right. happened, they had a deal and it fell apart in the 11th it hour. It fell apart Ultimately, in the 11th the hour. credit rating. Um, was downgraded, although downgraded. we did not go over the cliff. Global markets were still impacted. We didn't go over the cliff, but there were negative externalities. And President Biden wants no part of that again. He said never again to that nightmare. But the reality now is that he knows that with the Republicans not agreeing on what these cuts are, he wants them to make it plain so that they can show that to the public. Because remember, everything McCarthy has produced and shown the world as far as we want to get tighter on Social Security. Doesn't explain what exactly that is. Also, he made a lot of agreements while he was in the haze of hysteria trying to become Speaker of the House. And so now the more extremist members of the Republican conference are saying, you need to fight for the things you agreed to fight for, or we have that motion to vacate that we can pull at any moment. Stephen, I want to go to you on that point and on this idea of what are Republicans willing to actually cut, which Leanne brought up as well. I want to play you some sound from Elise Stefanik and get your reaction on the other side. Do you have areas in your mind that you think are ripe for spending cuts? Where would you cut? 
Well, absolutely. We need to look at every dollar when it comes to discretionary spending. We see the waste, fraud, and abuse that exists in these agencies. Take a look at the Department of Defense. Now, I've been a strong advocate when it comes to making sure that we have the resources for strong national security. But their woke agenda, we ought to be going after those programs that are not focused on what DOD should be focused on, but are far-left radical agendas. Also, look at the unspent COVID funds. That's hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars that we can go after immediately. Stephen, officials at the DOD take exception to this idea of a woke agenda, <laughs> by the way. But there's still a lack of specificity, right? right. I, I mean, it, how much of a challenge is that for... Yeah, look, I think except with the exception of the, the last her last point, which is unspent COVID mm -hmm. dollars, I think that's that's real. It doesn't it doesn't get us anywhere, really, in terms of, of deficits. She's not offering specifics. The waste, fraud, and abuse thing, if you talk to people who are real budget cutters, in Washington, they laugh at the phrase waste, right. fraud, and abuse. Of course we would like to cut waste, fraud, and abuse. But when you're talking about what gets at the heart of the $31 trillion national debt that we have, it's entitlements and it's entitlement reform. And Republicans back in the Paul Ryan era, era 2011, 2012, 2013, included entitlement reform in their budgets. There was a belief that they were going to take political hits for doing so. They didn't really. This Republican Party is in a very different place. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump campaigned against entitlement reform in 2016. He said just the other day, don't even think about reforming Social Security and Medicare. And until you get to the point where Republicans are willing to do this, which does open them up to attacks from Democrats, this stuff is, it's just small bear. I, I do think it's so notable because you keep bringing up 2011. I mean, Leanne, how much is that just looming so large over these negotiations? And, and, and within that question, is Speaker McCarthy weakened because of the um, divisions that exist within his own conference? Absolutely to both. I mean, as far as 2011 is concerned, there's a couple similarities. 2011, they were coming out of a financial crisis, mm -hmm. right? Right now we're coming out of a health crisis. So there were, are some spending, they're different, but there was a lot of spending that happened in the years preceding it. Um, but as reporting has been said that President Biden, there was some PTSD after that, mm, after right. 2011, and he has learned and he's not quite there yet, not willing to negotiate. But as far as Leader McCarthy is concerned, he has to get his party on the same page. And in those concessions he had to make, a lot of those things don't line up, including balancing the budget in 10 years is not going to be possible when you are talking only about non-defense discretionary mm -hmm. spending, which is only about $800 billion right. and per fiscal year. So the party has some tough choices and some tough perhaps campaign promises and promises <laughs> that they're going to have to make. I think the other thing working against McCarthy is that three times Donald Trump asked Republicans to raise the debt limit. Right. Three mm. times they did it. How now do you have smoke for a Democratic Well, and it's president? not just that. It's not just that. I mean, Donald Trump is responsible for $7.8 trillion of right. debt on his own. Republicans were absent yeah. through the Trump years in talking about fiscal restraint. It's hard for them to say now this on discretionary spending alone, right? They're not talking about entitlement reform. We have to do this. It just Let's, feels like a phony fight, even right. for somebody who's, I, I think we need real spending reform. You raised the issue of Donald Trump. I have to ask you guys about <laughs> the fact that he was back on the trail. And, and Stephen, it was notable because uh, Governor Sununu was not impressed. He said that his speech was lackluster in New Hampshire. What do you make of that? And do you think that people are underestimating uh, the impact that he is going to have as we get closer to 2024? I mean, Look, I'd love to be able to offer a straight line projection as to what Donald Trump is going to do. <laughs> I've done that before. It didn't work out so well. Governor Sununu was not in New Hampshire for the speech, which I found was mm -hmm. interesting, the, the mm -hmm. annual retreat for Republicans in New Hampshire. I talked to him on, on Friday, interviewed him uh, for the Dispatch podcast, and he was pretty blunt about mm. Donald Trump and about his ability to be a serious contender and, and the, the desirability of Donald Trump to be a serious contender. If Republicans are willing to speak out, as Governor Sununu has, as some others have, criticizing Donald Trump, running against him in an aggressive way, not just running to be the one left right. over, um, then I think Donald Trump is in real trouble. But if not, we could see a But repeat. that's a huge if. Yes. Well, I don't see that happening. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that's interesting that we've seen in our polls, there's pessimism right. all around, and this issue of the classified documents has basically um, been washed out with voters, a majority of voters, saying that they disagree with how current president and former president have handled, even though there are significant differences. Right. 
Are Democrats kind of wringing their hands over that issue? I think it's an acceptance of the fact that the public doesn't do nuance, right? Like, and so getting clear immediately is important. And I think we're seeing that clarity already from Democrats who are drawing the contrast. Because if people in this country are so negative, so down, it's always going to be an election of contrast, just like 2022, just like 2020. Leanne, let me just end by reading this quote from The Atlantic today. Faced with the prospect of another election cycle dominated by Trump and uncertain that he can actually be beaten in the primaries, many Republicans are quietly rooting for something to happen that will make him go away. And they would <laughs> strongly prefer not to make it happen themselves. Sounds a lot like 2016. It, it absolutely the early does. Days. <laughs> yes, the early days. In that campaign year, I covered the grassroots and I covered the donors of the Republican Party. And that was fascinating because the grassroots got there a lot sooner than the donors. But what's interesting that Trump is doing right now, he in the past, um, over the weekend, he kind of engaged in retail politics. Mm. Like, Something that he has never really done before. So is he going to continue this? Is this a weakness that he sees that he needs to engage in? But also in South Carolina, a lot of South Carolinian, South Carolinian Republicans were not there at mm. his rally. He did not have the support of the institution of the party. There's other South Carolinians who might jump in the race, Nikki Haley, Tim Scott, et cetera. So it could be a lot more crowded and difficult. This oh, time. it definitely will get more crowded. All right, great Monday conversation. Yeah. Thanks to all of you, Leanne, Juanita, and Stephen. Really appreciate it. And up next, President Biden just gave a one-word answer to the question of whether the White House will send F-16s to Ukraine. We'll tell you what it is and have the very latest from the Pentagon next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Just moments ago, President Biden was asked by reporters if the U.S. will be sending F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. His answer was one word, no. It comes as Ukraine has renewed its push for U.S. air support after the U.S. and Germany announced plans to arm Ukrainian forces with tanks. On the issue of public support for Ukraine aid, our NBC News poll shows just how divided America is. 49% support providing more funding and weapons, 47% oppose it, and just 41% of Americans approve of President Biden's handling of the war in Ukraine. Joining me now to discuss this is Courtney Kuby, who covers the Pentagon for NBC News. She joins me now. Court, good to see you. So look, we know that the White House has reversed itself on previous requests for military aid to Ukraine. Could that happen in this case with the request for F-16s, despite the president saying, no, they're not going to send them? In just another one word answer, yes, that absolutely <laughs> could happen. I think it is very possible that will happen in this case because we have seen it happen time and time again, where the U.S., the Biden administration has been resistant to a weapon system, particularly one that they worry may be provocative or escalatory to Vladimir Putin. Um, and then after weeks or months of negotiations and discussions, they get to a yes. We recently saw it with the tanks only a few weeks earlier. We saw it with the Patriot missile defense systems that the U.S. pledged to send one and a number of interceptors to Ukraine for their air defense system. And that's exactly what these, these F-16s, if the U.S. gets to yes on this, would provide. It would provide an integrated air defense system uh, by providing the Ukrainians with attack air to use uh, over those, their skies in Ukraine. But like the concerns with the tanks and the Patriots, they take a very long time to train on, and they take an extremely long time uh, to train for the maintenance and for the logistics mm -hmm. package for an F-16. I will say the one system that we have that the, U, the U.S. has been at a no all along has been a similar one, and that is the MiGs. The difference here mm. is the F-16s is something that the U.S. could potentially pull out of an inventory versus the MiGs, which the U.S. just does not fly. Mm. Court, I want to ask you and, and turn to a, another area that you are watching, China. You helped break this story last week that an Air Force general is predicting war with China in 2025. Tell us about this. What led to this stark warning? So this was a very candid memo from the head of Air Mobility Command, uh, of an Air Force four-star general, General Minahan. But if you get down to sort of the meat of what the memo is, he's telling the men and women under his command that they need to be ready and that they need to step up their training because he's concerned about this war for a number of reasons that are not a surprise to people. One is that the U.S. is going to be in a presidential election and may be distracted and that Taiwan has an election coming up and that it may be a, a ripe opportunity for President Xi in China to invade Taiwan. But there's no other sort of special circumstances or intelligence that he talks about in 
in this memo that would indicate that, that China is any closer to an invasion of Taiwan than the, the overall circumstances that we're all already aware of. But again, what he's saying here is that the Air Force, the men and women serving under Air Mobility Command, need to take this potential very seriously and need to start preparing for it now. Some of the things in it that are kind of shocking to read, one is that he wants the men and women mm -hmm. to be prepared to use their weapons. Mm -hmm. He tells them that they need to have their legal uh, affairs in order um, and that they, in that, if that includes visiting legal house or uh, the, the, base, the base legal authority to do so in the coming days and weeks, All Kristen. Right. Courtney Cuby covering all the angles. Thank you. And thank you for being with us this hour. I'm back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson. Right. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.